By the time we reach adulthood and come face to face with the full complexities of life, balancing out career aspirations and a family life and a social life, and hopefully also a healthy internal life, when we get to that stage of adulthood and those full levels of responsibility, we've already been through years of training around managing our time from experiences in early education through to high school and college, time-strict schedules have marked the path for us. But what if managing your time wasn't the best way to actually perform well at work and show up in the way that you would like to in your personal life? The authors of the book, The Power of Full Engagement, Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz, argue that it's actually energy, not time, that's the fundamental currency of high performance. And in this video, I'm going to share a visual summary of some of the key ideas from that book because I've found them to be incredibly impactful and they've shifted the way that I approach my life and the decisions that I make each day. One of the first things they point out about time compared to energy is that time is a fixed quantity. There's only so much of it every day. Energy, on the other hand, is not fixed. The amount of energy that you have during any specific period of time is totally dependent on a whole variety of conditions. And the overall argument of this book is that it's worth it to pay more attention to your energy than it is to pay attention to time and specific schedules. Because that focus on time comes from a machine-centered way of viewing the world and of viewing the human experience in it. That machine-centered approach is all about the optimization of technology and equipment. But we humans are not machines, and thinking of ourselves as one isn't that helpful. So instead, this focus on energy comes from a human-centered point of view, where the goal here is the optimization of alertness and performance, emphasizing again that it's not necessarily the amount of time that you devote to any particular task, it's the quality of the energy that you give to that task. And as I'm sure you can imagine, whether you're thinking about time spent with family or time spent on a work project, even just 20 minutes of high quality energy does a ton more good than an hour or two of very low energy toward that task. That machine-centered approach reminds me of some ideas that I read about in Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, which I explored in another video. In that book, Newport contrasts digital minimalism to digital maximalism, where the idea is to adopt any new technology that provides even the smallest benefit, disregarding the potentially huge cost that might come along with the adoption of that technology. That digital maximalist or machine-centered approach has the potential to lead us astray from what's actually the most helpful for us. Searching for the best productivity app might take you in the wrong direction. Rather than seeking out that external technological tool, better to turn inward and pay more attention to the energy that you're bringing to the work in front of you. So the goal of this book then is to help us bring our best energy to the various things we spend our time on each day. And what I found to be helpful here are the four categories of energy that the authors choose to focus on. The first is physical, with the ideal state being physically energized. Then there's emotional energy, with the goal of feeling emotionally connected. Then we've got mental energy, with the ideal state being mentally focused. And last but not least, spiritual energy, with the ideal state being when our actions are in alignment with our deepest values. Now, of course, these different categories of energy aren't independent of each other. They are very much connected. But the authors point out that generally we tend to be overtrained, overextended when it comes to the mental energy and emotional energy that we expend each day, often in the service of getting more done quicker. And we tend to neglect our physical energy and our spiritual energy. And as you'll see in a few minutes here, the authors devote a full chapter to each of these types of energy. But first, let's take a deeper look into how these authors think about energy in general and then we'll apply it to these specific areas. So there's one main idea that the authors hammer home time and time again throughout this book, and that's the importance of this cycle of expending energy and then giving yourself time to recover energy before you go expend more of it. That cycle is what we as human beings need. 
in order to continue performing well. And they point out that if you manage that cycle well, you can actually expand your capacity for work, your capacity to expend energy in any one of those four categories that we just mentioned. So here that's like increasing the size of your battery. In order to increase that size, you first have to expend energy past your current limits, but then equally important is giving yourself the opportunity to recover. Without that recovery period, your battery doesn't grow, you just burn out. On the flip side of that, if you don't expend energy within one of those given categories, your battery will contract. Your tank of physical energy, for example, or your tank of spiritual energy will be smaller because of its lack of use. So what I find helpful about this overall framework is that it encourages you to have this balance of expending energy and recovering energy across those four categories. That's what will lead to a fully engaged life, which is one of the ways I define success in my life. And here they encourage you to think about your energy use throughout the day as oscillating with peaks and valleys, times when you're working hard in a given area, other times when you're resting. That oscillation stands in pretty stark contrast to a linear view of energy expenditure, which I feel like often is at the core of a bunch of productivity systems or time management systems. The assumption that within every single block of 30 minutes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., you'll be able to bring the same amount of energy. That's just not how humans work. So as you think about and plan out your days, you should plan for that oscillation in energy, not for a steady state of it. And it's with the idea of planning for that oscillation that rituals come in. Some rituals that focus on the exercise piece, the expenditure of energy, other rituals that focus on the recovery side. It's the balance of those two types of rituals throughout your day that will help you maximize the quality of energy, the quality of attention that you're able to bring to each task, each interaction, each thing that you encounter throughout the day. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is how many examples of those rituals that they provide. You get these snapshots of real people that the authors worked with and the specific challenges that they had and the rituals that they built into their days to address those challenges and kind of balance out those energies. Add some exercise in the categories that were lacking, add some recovery in those that were overextended. Throughout the rest of this video, I'll be sharing some of my rituals as we look at each category of energy, starting with physical. The authors describe your physical energy as the most fundamental of the four. Because if you're lacking on your physical energy level, it's pretty hard to bring high quality emotional, mental, or spiritual energy to whatever it is that's in front of you. And here I'll highlight five components of your physical health that are worth paying attention to, starting with the breath. Probably the simplest and most accessible lever of physical energy that can be accessed through deep breathing. This cycle between taking a deep breath in to a count of three and then a slow breath out to a count of six. It's sometimes surprising how easy it is for us to get stuck in this shallow breathing based on whatever stresses we might be encountering throughout the day. But taking the time to slow down, go through a few cycles of this deep breathing, that's an example of these small but impactful recovery activities that when done regularly throughout the day add up to have a huge impact. In this case, on the physical energy that you can bring to a task, but also the bit of emotional recovery that comes with those deep breaths. But of course, deep breathing alone won't bring you all of the physical energy you need. Food is pretty darn important too. And the approach that the authors suggest here, yes, eating the three standard meals of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but never overdoing it on those meals and having a snack in between so that you replenish that source of energy every three hours or so. And that's one area you can imagine that oscillation in practice with the goal here of sustained energy throughout the day. Never letting yourself get too hungry, but also never getting too full. Those three hour cycles, plus the tip of drinking lots of water throughout the day will give your body what it needs from a nutritional standpoint. And in the book, they dive deeper into the specific types of foods that they encourage in case you wanna check that out. And then the piece of advice that you're probably tired of hearing, but maybe not yet actually applying to your life, getting enough sleep. 
the importance of that seven to eight hours every night. Though that might be familiar, I feel like the reminder never hurts, especially remembering that it's during sleep that growth and repair occurs throughout your body, within your brain, of course, but also your whole system, keeping you healthy and working the way it should. With sleep filling that recovery part of the energy cycle, spending time on your physical fitness gets the exercise part. And the authors talk about the benefits both of cardio work and strength training, with the goal being to rhythmically raise and lower your heart rate. How good that is for your body, how good that is for your brain. And then in addition to sleep being the way you recover at night, it's also worth pointing out the importance of recovery throughout the day, specifically needed every 90 to 120 minutes. Here they point out that in addition to circadian rhythms that occur every 24 hours, there are also ultradian cycles that occur throughout the day. And how when you look at the combination of circadian rhythms and ultradian rhythms, the lowest point overall is around 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Which for me is helpful to know that that has a biological cause, and it might not be the best idea to fight that dip with caffeine or just self-imposed pressure to get more work done. Better instead to fill that time with the recovery activity. And here I'll share a few of my rituals that apply to physical energy. I've settled into a three-part exercise routine that I really enjoy. I'll go for a run on one day, do some yoga the next, and then some strength training the day after that, and then start the cycle over again. I like that variety each day, never doing the same type of exercise two days in a row. And I think that hits at a nice overall balance of some cardio, some strength, and some flexibility. I also find that this exercise routine hits on all four categories of energy. It is, of course, a physical experience, but it also leads to emotional recovery and, especially when I'm out on a run, good mental activity. Insights often come without me really having to work at it. And then yoga in particular, and also running outside, have a spiritual component to them that I enjoy. And the second newer physical ritual that I started after reading this book is a deep breathing practice. I try to kickstart that when I first enter my home office after breakfast, do a handful of cycles then, because I find that having a dedicated time in the morning for some deep breathing, that just makes it more likely that I'll remember to do it throughout the day after that, especially in those times when I maybe am transitioning from one mode of work to another. Speaking of transitions, let's move next to emotional energy. With this, as well as the next two types of energy, the authors identify the metaphorical muscles that are worth exercising here. That fits along with the general theme of athletics that is also a part of the background of these researchers, where they first identified the importance of small but impactful recovery systems. As someone who played a lot of sports growing up and continues to enjoy physical activity, those references to athletic performance and how they can tie directly to other forms of performance really resonated with me. For emotional energy, the muscles they identified are self-confidence, self-control, social skills, and empathy. And the thing that I'd like to highlight from this chapter are first the things that tend to expend your emotional energy, and then some activities to help you recover that energy. On the expenditure side, it tends to be negative emotions that draw down your energy levels. Emotions like fear and frustration, anger and sadness. And there's some nice nuance here, the author's pointing out that those negative emotions aren't entirely bad. In fact, they play an important role in life. They direct us toward something that needs addressing. On the flip side of that, experiencing too much of those negative emotions releases stress hormones that can become toxic in your body. So the approach here is not to ignore those negative emotions, but instead to first acknowledge them, but then rather than just sitting within them for long periods of time, try to move toward a recovery activity that helps bring you back to at least a neutral, if not positive state, where you're more likely to be able to address the thing that caused that negative emotion in the first place. So this is where the refueling activities come in. To refill your emotional energy tank, the authors encourage you to seek out activities for pure enjoyment or that are deeply relaxing. One example is a person who signed up for dance classes after work a couple days a week and the joy that that brought into her life, not to mention the physical benefits as well. 
Reading fiction was another example that fits more into the deeply relaxing category. Time spent in nature gets at both, as does grabbing a cup of coffee with a good friend and having a nice chat. Some of these activities make me think once again of digital minimalism and what Newport calls high quality leisure and how those are the types of activities that you might bring into your life after ramping down on the amount of digital media that you consume. And one example here from the world of athletics, tennis specifically, was comparing and contrasting the career of John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors. The heyday of these two athletes was a bit before my time, but even so, I was familiar with McEnroe, really only because of his reputation for getting angry and frustrated, throwing rackets, yelling at the refs. Connors, on the other hand, I hadn't heard of. And while both of these athletes were very successful, the important distinction is that McEnroe had an angry short career, whereas Connors had a joyful and playful long career, which just highlights how leaning too far into those negative emotions, even if you feel like those are fueling you, they're not sustainable. Not in the way that approaching that sport, that career, that family life in a joyful and playful manner are. But again, I appreciate that importance of giving the appropriate amount of attention to negative emotions, not blocking them out, not ignoring them, but instead acknowledging and addressing them. For me, that fits into mindfulness, a skill that I've tried to develop over the years. This general, ever-present awareness of what's going on inside of you, some non-judgmental observation, and then responding accordingly. And getting to some of my routines here, I'll mention first a decision that I made after reading Digital Minimalism, and that was to dramatically cut down on my digital media consumption, not watching Netflix alone, not visiting Twitter or Facebook or Instagram at all, even cutting back on my podcast listening, and instead shifting my media consumption almost exclusively to physical books, both fiction and nonfiction. I start and end my day reading a novel. I enjoy that both as a way to kind of wake up and then also as a way to wind down. And then at various times throughout the day, in between work tasks or family commitments, I've got a couple of nonfiction books that I'm reading. And as I think about my life over the past few months since I made that shift in the type of media that I consume, I think it's within this category of emotional energy that I've seen the biggest impact. My overall energy levels are a lot higher and a lot more positive than they were when social media was a big part of my life or when I was watching a lot of Netflix on my own. And as I mentioned in the previous section, I feel like my exercise routine has a large impact on my emotional energy levels as well, where I'm expending physical energy, but refueling my emotional energy. Let's next move to the third category of mental energy. The individual muscles to build, being mental preparation, positive self-talk, creativity, effective time management, and visualization. It's worth pointing out the paradox of time management showing up here. Even though this book as a whole is about energy management, time management is still a useful skill. But I think of it as one that's lower in the hierarchy. It's useful, it has its place, but it's somewhat secondary to energy management. Within this chapter, the authors identify a set of performance enhancers related to the use of mental energy, the value of sustained concentration, as opposed to bouncing too quickly from one task to the next, or trying to do multiple tasks at once. Here I'm reminded again of Cal Newport's work, this time the book Deep Work, which I found to be helpful in shaping my approach to the creative work that I do. Another performance enhancer is uh, moving from broad to narrow, thinking about the topic in front of you from a very broad zoomed out perspective, and then zooming back in and taking the narrow view. How viewing things from both of those perspectives can enhance the quality of your mental work. A similar cycle is a back and forth between an internal focus, what's going on inside of you, how the ideas are applied to your life, and an external focus, how what you're working on applies to other people. And the fourth performance enhancer is realistic optimism. And I really like that combination of words. It's not about head in the clouds or head in the sand. It's about keeping your eyes open, seeing the world as it is, and always working positively toward a desired outcome or solution. Maintaining that sense of realistic optimism will help you do better work. 
without getting distracted by fantasies or bogged down by self-doubt or whatever frustration might be the current barrier to the work at hand. Another kind of more general tip here when it comes to mental energy is how powerful it can be to intermittently change mental channels. And this concept here maybe had one of the most dramatic impacts on how I think about my day and how I choose the sequence of activities that I might take on. I mentioned starting my day with fiction, but then reading plenty of nonfiction throughout the day, bouncing from that type of activity to maybe sketching out some of the ideas that I'm reading about, then moving from that type of mental work over to editing a video, for example. From there, maybe I'll shift over to those more internal activities to an external one and engage with the community members inside of verbal to visual the online learning platform that I host where I teach the skill that I'm demonstrating here called sketchnoting, also known as visual note-taking. Then maybe I'll hop back to some editing or reading, then maybe hop over to email for those one-on-one -on -one interactions, clear that particular inbox out, then maybe back to some sketching or switching over to some rest. I feel pretty lucky to have the flexibility in my schedule to decide what type of activity to spend the next 30 minutes or an hour on, then stepping back, maybe taking a deep breath or two, and thinking about what mental channel would feel the most refreshing to switch to next. I also think this applies well to thinking about the four different categories of energy. Instead of just switching between mental channels, sometimes I recognize I need a break from mental work entirely and would benefit from from expending some physical energy. Within this chapter on mental energy, the authors also do a deep dive into the brain and how creativity works. They talk about the differences between what's going on in the left side of the brain versus the right side of the brain. How the left side is where sequential and time conscious and logical thinking occurs. And the right side is where spatial thinking, relating parts to the whole, and where intuition and insight crop up. And as far as creativity goes, they identify this five-step process that involves a bouncing back and forth between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Starting on the right side with a first insight, the initial spark of a new idea, then hop into the left for saturation, more of a research stage, intentionally explore whatever was at the core of that insight. Then you hop back to the right side for an incubation period where you're mulling over those ideas. The next step of illumination is also on the right side. That's where a breakthrough occurs, something that helps you bring all of those ideas together or recognize the most important nugget of whatever it is you've been thinking about and then it's back to the left side for verification, where you think more logically through whatever it is that you came up with to confirm how valid or not it is. Those activities that occur in the right hemisphere, those happen when not actively seeking answers, which highlights the importance of changing mental channels throughout your day, but also providing those activities that are purely about recovery or that focus on expending energy in one of the other three categories. Like how I mentioned going for a run is often a great time to let my mind wander, and that's where those creative steps of first insight, incubation, and illumination often occur. Let's now move to the fourth and final category of energy, spiritual. In a lot of ways, this is the one that I was maybe most curious about because I wanted to know how they define spiritual energy and what type of activities would fall into the exercise or recovery categories. The definition resonated with me more than I thought it might, which focuses on this alignment between your actions and your deepest values. The metaphorical muscles here being character, passion, integrity, honesty, and commitment where spirituality is about the connection to a deeply held set of values and to a purpose beyond our self-interest. And it's this category of energy that's probably the easiest to overlook. But taking the time to identify your deepest values and to identify a purpose that exists beyond your own self-interest, that in itself becomes an energy source that feeds into all the others and that will support the particular actions that you take each day. On the exercise side of things, some of the activities that you can do to tap into spiritual energy are things like meditation, yoga, simply setting aside time to reflect on your values, 
and being of service to others. On the renewal side, we see once again time spent in nature, which also showed up when exploring emotional energy, or just reading a good book, especially those that address or explore what it means to live a good life, whether that's nonfiction or fiction. Listening to music is another one of those spiritual activities that can provide renewal. And for me, what resonates around identifying these deeply held set of values and a purpose beyond our own self-interest, I think about parenthood. I'm the father of twin boys who just turned one year old about a week ago. And three days a week, I'm on childcare duty during the full work day, which has led to a pretty significant shift in where I spend my energy. One challenging piece being how much I enjoy the work that I do and how easy it was early on to try to cram too much into a single day. Too much multitasking. Yes, watching after the boys, but also maybe trying to get a few emails out or a little bit of editing done. Eventually, the practice that I found to be the most helpful was switching mentally into weekend mode after the boys' first nap. As far as dedicated work sessions go, I've got the early morning when my wife and I wake up, but before she heads off to work, I've got a chunk of time there. And then I've got their first nap, which is occurring right now while I'm recording this. But once they wake up, which could happen at any moment now because I've been <laughs> recording for a while, that's when I try to make this mental shift of leaving work behind and giving my full attention to the boys and to some basic maintenance tasks around the house. And for me, there's something that just works better about switching into weekend mode, not just that it's the end of my work day. There's just something about imagining it as Saturday that makes it easier to take pressure off of myself for getting more work done. And because of that, I've found that I enjoy my days overall a lot more. I think I'm more efficient with those dedicated work sessions and the quality of my time and attention with the boys is a lot higher. Another ritual that my wife and I have added into our weekly routine is a Sunday night chat after the boys are in bed, a space to have deeper conversations that aren't just around scheduling and the next day's events. That's a regular opportunity for us to reflect on our values, among other things, while also addressing bigger questions or bigger challenges that are easy to neglect or push off in the face of all of the day-to-day -day things that can occupy our attention. So at this stage of life, at least, my connection to this spiritual energy comes from a focus on family life. And while there are plenty of family and child care tasks that are quite physically and emotionally draining, there's a whole lot of spiritual renewal that comes along with my interactions with the boys and seeing them grow up. So as you have probably seen here, there's a comprehensiveness to these four categories of energy that I really appreciate, as well as a simplicity to this overall approach to energy expenditure and energy recovery that made me want to spend so much time here sharing these ideas with you, because sharing them in this way helps to solidify them in my own mind and apply them in my own life. That's actually what first pulled me into the world of visual note taking, the world of sketch noting, how a common experience for me was to read a book and enjoy it, be able to talk about it and maybe apply those ideas while reading and maybe for a few weeks or months after, but how quickly those ideas faded into the background. But when I instead started engaging with those ideas on a deeper level, primarily by sketching them out, giving myself this helpful reference, identifying the overall framework and illustrating some of the specific examples, I've come to really value and appreciate that way of interacting with a book or of any information source. And if that's a skill that you would like to develop as well to create your own visual summaries of the books you're reading or classes you're attending or podcasts you're listening to, then come join us inside of Verbal to Visual. That's where I teach this skill. That's where you'll find a full library of complete at your own pace online courses, as well as a global community of visual thinkers who are sharing their work as they engage with the ideas that are the most important to them. 
You can learn more about that and sign up at verbaltovisual.com. I hope that you have enjoyed this exploration of the power of full engagement. If so, I encourage you to pick up the book, learn from all of the other examples that are shared, as well as all of the other details that I didn't have time to mention here. Thank you so much for watching this video, spending your time and attention here. I wish you luck deciding what to do with your energy next, and I look forward to sharing more ideas with you next time. Till then.